What's up everybody, welcome to another video and I hope you're ready to flex those brain muscles. A little while ago I made a video where I introduced the concept of sets. I talked about what a set is, what a subset is, some basic notation, some examples. We built some intuition around that idea. And in this video, I'm going to extend on that and talk about set operations, such as union, intersection, difference, and complement. We're gonna draw some pictures, build some intuition, look at an example, and then at the end, even do a couple of proofs. So if you're brand new to sets and you wanna check out the introduction video, I'll link it right above. But if you're ready to dive into some set operations, then let's go ahead and get started. All right, so let's start off with the definition of union and intersection, and keep in mind that A and B are just arbitrary sets. These definitions work for any two sets. So A union B is how we read this out loud usually, and this is read as A intersect B, or the intersection of A and B, right? So the union of A and B is the set of all elements that are in A or in B. In other words, X is an element of A union B, if and only if X is an element of A or X is an element of B. And the biggest mistake I see students make here is that they interpret this or as an either or, right? In other words, they interpret this as either X is an element of A or X is an element of B, but it can't be an element of both, which is not true. We do consider elements that are in both A and B in the union. And that's because in math, we usually use what's called an inclusive or, unless it's otherwise stated, or in math means inclusive. So that means we're looking at the elements that are in A or B or both A and B. And this visually makes sense if we draw a Venn diagram. So here's the universal set. So this is just all the things we're considering subsets of, right? And here I'll draw a set A and here's a set B. I'll label these A and B. So Let's see, all the elements of A. Well, that's all the elements in here, right? This is A, so we're considering all these elements. And what about the elements of B? Well, that's these elements here, right? So any element in here is in B. And you see they overlap here, and that's okay, right? We still include that intersection where they're in both A and B, okay? So this represents the union visually as a Venn diagram. And I sort of gave away what intersection is gonna be because I talked about it here, right? The intersection of two sets is the set of all elements that are in A and in B. So if we draw a Venn diagram again, and we look at two sets A and B, I'll label this A, I'll label this B, this of course is our universal set, then all these elements in here are, are in the intersection, right? These are the elements that are in A and B. Okay, and what we can see actually is that this intersection is always a subset of the union. So I'll write that off to the side here. A intersect B is always a subset of A union B. In other words, if X is in the intersection, then X is definitely in the union. And this can be proved pretty easily in like one or two lines. So maybe we'll do that toward the end of the video. But hopefully this makes sense. When I think of union, I think of or. When I think of intersection, I think of and. You're just gonna make sure that you know that this or is not an either or, it's an inclusive or. All right, so now we'll go ahead and define set difference and complement. So starting with set difference, which I personally read this out loud as A minus B. It just feels like the most natural way to read it. You may hear it said differently, but not only that, we often see this notation using this minus symbol. This comes up a lot. These both come up frequently. So it's good to know that when A and B are sets, both of these are talking about the set difference, which is defined as all the elements that are in A and the elements that are not in B. So this should line up intuitively with this idea of subtraction. At least I think it does, right? Because first we're looking at the set A and we're considering all of the elements in A. Whichever of these elements are in B, we're taking away those elements. And the elements that we're left with, that's exactly the set difference. So let's look at this using a Venn diagram and just solidify our understanding of this. So here's our set A, here's a set B. And remember, what we're doing is looking at all of the elements in A, that's what we start with. So we're gonna fill this entire thing in, all the elements in A. And then we're taking away elements that are in B. So that means what we end up removing is the stuff in this intersection here. We're taking this away. 
and let me go ahead and fix my diagram. But what we're left with here is all the elements that are in A and the elements that are not in B, okay? Hopefully that makes sense. Now let's talk about the complement. So the complement of a set is all the elements that are in the universal set and are not in the set, right? And we often, when we say it like out loud and formally, we don't include this part, right? That's sort of understood. We just say, oh, those are the elements that are not in the set, right? So just a heads up for that. But let's go ahead and draw what this means in a Venn diagram. And just to be consistent, I'll use both A and B, even though we don't really have an A here in our definition. So here's A, here's B. So we're looking at all the elements that are in our universal set and are not in B. So I'm simply gonna look at this circle here, B, and fill in everything that's outside of that circle. Right, everything that's outside. That is the complement of that set, B. Now, one thing I want to point out is this A minus B is often referred to as the relative complement. And the reason why is because, let's look at these definitions, replace this A with the universal set. Then what do we have? These become the exact same thing, right? In other words, this complement of B is the same thing as universal set minus B, okay? These are the same thing. So this is often be called the relative complement because we are taking the complement, but instead of considering the universal set, we're considering some subset of that, right? So you will see that come up. Another connection I wanna make is, let's look at exactly what this A minus B actually is. This A minus B, A minus B is equal to A intersect, what? The complement of B right? All the elements that are in A and the elements that are not in B, which is literally just the definition. So this is very easy to prove. It's only a few lines, but these two things are the same thing. The last thing I want to point out is you may see another notation for complement. Actually, when I first learned it, I saw this notation, B with a bar. You may see that. The problem with this is that when I took topology, this bar referred to the closure, right? So I got really confused. So I actually reverted back to this other notation, but you may see other notations come up, so just keep that in mind. Now, let's get some practice with an actual example. So now it's time to practice and test your understanding with an example. So I've defined this universal set as A, B, C, D, E, one, two, three, four, five. So just the first five letters of the alphabet and the first five positive integers. Then I've defined this set, capital A, as A, B, C, one, two, three and this set capital B as CD34. And what I'm asking you to do is find A union B, A intersect B, A minus B, and the complement of A. So if you wanna test your understanding, pause the video, pull out a piece of paper and a pencil, try this on your own, and then press play if you want to check your answer. So at this point, I'm gonna assume you all paused and you have correct answers and you're just wanting to double check. So let's go ahead and start. We're gonna find A union B. And remember, this means we're looking for all the elements that are in A, or in B, or both, right? So all of these elements in A are going to be in our union, and all of these elements in B are gonna be in our union. So really, this union of A and B is just A, B, C, D, one, two, three, four. Remember, we don't repeat elements in sets. We write each element once. And this is the list of all the elements that are in A or B. And if you'll notice, and I think I mentioned this pattern earlier, is that whenever we're taking the union of two sets, it's always the case that each of these sets represented in the union is a subset of the union. And that's true if there's more than two sets as well. If we have the union of three sets, four sets, et cetera, that's always true. So what I mean by that formally is that it's always the case that A is a subset of A union B, and it's always the case for B as well. B is always a subset of A union B. And the way I think about this intuitively is that if I take a set and then take the union of that set with another set, if the set B is the same as A, then A union B is just equal to A. They're the same set, right? But if the set B contains elements that aren't in A, then this union is gonna just have more elements than A, but A is still gonna be contained in this union, 
right? In other words, we can only ever add elements. We can never take away elements, and that's why A is always a subset, and similarly, that's why B is always a subset. Hopefully that makes sense. That's the way my brain thinks about it, at least. Okay, now let's look at A intersect B. So these are elements that are in both A and B. So little a and little b are not going to be in the intersection, but c is. d is not going to be in the intersection. Neither is 1 or 2, but 3 is. 3 is in both a and b. And that's going to be it. We're not going to include 4 because that's not in both a and b. So a intersects b is the set c3. And we have sort of a similar pa pattern with the intersection, but it's reversed. a intersect b is always a subset of A, and it's also the case that A intersect B is always a subset of B, right? So when we take intersections, sort of the opposite thing happens. Remember I mentioned when we take unions, the set can only get bigger. When we take intersections, the set can really only get smaller, unless of course A equals B. That means A intersect B is literally just A, right? But if B is not the same as A, then we're gonna be taking away elements, right? This intersection is gonna not have elements that are in A, so it's going to be a proper subset in that case. That's, again, just the way I think about it. Hopefully that makes sense. A minus B, let's look at this. A minus B, so we look at all the elements in A, and then we take away elements that are in B. In other words, this is the set of all elements that are in A and are not in B. So we're gonna include little a and little b, but we're not going to include c. Then we're going to include 1 and 2, but we're not going to include 3. Okay, so that's a minus b. Now let's look at the complement of a. Remember, this is the same as taking the universal set and subtracting a, right? So we're taking the universal set and we're removing all of the elements that are in A. What that's going to leave us with is all the stuff that's in this set U but not in A. So we're going to have D and E as well as 4 and 5. D, E, 4, 5. That's going to be the complement of A. One last thing I want to point out because I think it's going to be a fun example to prove at the end of this video is look at A intersect B and A minus B. I have A, B, 1, 2, and here I have C, 3. If I take the union of those two sets, I get A, right? And my claim is that this is true in general. And let me go ahead and write out explicitly what I mean. My claim is that A is always equal to A intersect B union a minus B. And that's something we're going to prove at the end of this video. I think it's a great example for how to prove that two sets are equal. And we're also going to prove some of these subset statements as well. So to finish off the video, we're going to do three examples of proofs involving sets. These are the first two examples, and these, I will admit, are very short and straightforward, but they will hopefully get across the general idea of how to prove a set as a subset of another set. That's the goal here. The next example we're going to show is what I just showed earlier, which was that A is equal to the union of A intersect B and A minus B, and hopefully that will be a good example to highlight how we show two sets are equal. That's a very common thing we have to do in math. So let's start with these two examples. We want to show that A is a subset of A union B. How exactly do we do that? Well, to show that, we need to show that every element in A is also an element in A union B. And to do that, we usually let there be some arbitrary element in A. So let X be an element in A. And then we work towards showing that X must also be an element of A union B. And what that shows is that any arbitrary element of A is also an element of A union B, and therefore A is a subset of A union B. Hopefully that makes sense. So we let there be some arbitrary element of A, and in this case it's a little bit silly what we do, because we just say, well, if X is an element of A, then surely this statement is true, that X is an element of A or X is an element of B. Because all we need for this to be true is we need either X and A or X and B or both, right? And we have X and A, so this is clearly true. 
And by definition, this means that X is in A union B. So X is an element of A union B. Thus, we've completed the proof. A must be a subset of A union B, okay? So again, like I said, a pretty short, straightforward example, but hopefully that gets across the general idea of how we show a set is a subset of another set. So if you wanna pause the video and try this one, I encourage you to do that. But we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna let X be an element of A intersect B. And now what we're gonna do is use the definition of intersection. And this is something we do all the time. Whenever we let there be some element, we then use the definition of whatever the set is that we're dealing with, right? And in this case, if X is an element of A intersect B, then X is an element of A and X is an element of B. And since X is an element of A and X is an element of B, we actually already have what we want to show, which is that X must be an A, right? Just from this first part here. So what we can say is since X is an element of A, it must be the case that, well, we have our result, right? That's exactly what we want to show. Since X is an element of A, A intersect B must be a subset of A because any arbitrary element in A intersect B is also in A. So hopefully that general idea makes sense. And one last thing I want to point out, which is something I actually brought up in my introduction to sets video, is this idea of set transitivity, right? Since A intersect B is always a subset of A, and since A is always a subset of A union B, we also have that A intersect B is always a subset of A union B. And you can't actually prove this directly, and if you want to try for fun, I encourage you to do that a similar way that we did with these. But we actually have this result just from the fact that A intersect B is always a subset of A, and A is always a subset of A union B, and I proved that transitivity result in that introduction to sets video. So this must be true as well. All right, so here's our last example. We're gonna prove that A is equal to the union of A intersect B and A minus B. But before we jump into the formal proof, I wanna real quick show a diagram that'll hopefully help us intuitively understand why this statement is true. Obviously, proof by picture isn't a real thing. We still need to know how to do formal proofs but I think that conceptual understanding and intuition is just as important as formal math, which is why I'm a big fan of using these Venn diagrams to you know, understand these set statements. So let's jump right into it. What is A intersect B? I'm gonna color it in here with this fancy new blue chalk. That's A intersect B. And what is A minus B? That's all the stuff that is in A but is not in B. So that leaves us with this. Right? And if we look, we can hopefully visually see how if we include the set of all elements that are in A minus B or A intersect B, that it gives us exactly A, right? Hopefully we can see why this statement is true. Not only that, but we can hopefully see that these are two disjoint sets, meaning they have an empty intersection, right? So that's pretty cool to notice as well. But I like these Venn diagrams. I just wanted to show us visually why this is true. Now let's go ahead and jump into the formal proof. So the big question is, how do we prove that two sets are equal? Well, really what we have to do is show that they have exactly the same elements. And what that means is that every element of this set A must also be an element of the union of A intersect B and A minus B. And every element of the union of A intersect B and A minus B must be an element of A. In other words, they have to be subsets of each other, and that's exactly how we show the two sets are equal. It's a two-part proof, where first we show that A is a subset of this expression, and then we show that this expression is a subset of A. So, one more time, to show that two sets are equal, we must show that they are subsets of each other. It's a two-part proof. So first, how I usually label this is, I do the subset notation this way in a little parentheses, and to me that means that I'm proving the forward direction, that A is a subset of this expression, and then I do the opposite way for the reverse. That's just my personal notation, right? So first we're going to prove the statement that A is a subset of this expression, and we're going to do that 
exactly the way we did it with the last couple of problems, which is we're going to let x be an element of a, and hopefully work towards showing that it must be an element of this big scary guy here, right? Which turns out to not be that difficult if we do a proof by cases, okay? So if x is an element of a, then we have two cases. Case one is that x is also an element of b, right? So x is an element of a, and x is an element of b. But that means that x must be in the intersection of a and b, right? Since x is an element of a, and x is an element of b, x is in the intersection of a and b. And now this is going to look a little bit familiar, because if x is in the intersection of a and b, then this statement must be true. Then x is an element of a intersects b, or x is an element of a minus b. This is hopefully looking familiar, because this is always true. If x is an element of some set, then it's always an element of that set or any other random set we want to list, actually, right? This is always true because all we need is one of these to be true, and that first one we've confirmed is true. So because of this, what can we say? Well, this or means union. So we have that x is an element of a intersect b union a minus b, which is exactly what we wanted to show. So x is an element of a intersect b union a minus b, which is exactly what we wanted to show, okay? Hopefully that makes sense. Let's move on to case two. There are only two cases because x is either in b or x is not in b. This is binary. There is no other option. It's either an element of a set or it isn't, you know? It can't, these both can't be true. It can't be that neither of these are true, okay? So let's assume that x is not an element of b. Well, then what does that mean? Well, that means that then x is an element of A and x is not an element of B. So that means that x must be an element of A minus B. A must, uh, x must be an element of A minus B. Now the rest of the proof is essentially the same as we just did, right? Then this statement must be true that x is an element of a intersect b, or x is an element of a minus b, and this by definition gives us that x is in the union of these two sets. Because again, we know that this is true, so this or statement is always true, because we know one of them is true. Then x is an element of a intersect b union, a minus b, and that's it. We've proven the first direction because these are the only two cases, like I've said. So we did a proof by cases. We proved that a must be a subset of this expression here. So now let's prove the opposite direction. I'll go and erase this. So I went ahead and got us started on the reverse direction. I let there be an arbitrary element in a intersect b union, a minus b, and I concluded by the definition of union that x must be an element of a intersect b or x must be an element of a minus b. And now I'm going to do again a proof by cases, right? Because I have this or statement. I know that x is in a intersect b or x is in a minus b. So let's consider each of these cases, right? Case one, x is in a intersect b. What does this give us? Well, by the definition of intersection, then x is in A and x is an element of B. And now we've already got what we want, because remember, we're letting there be an arbitrary element in this expression, and we want to show that that means it must be an A. Then x is in A, right? We already have what we want. So since x is in A, Well, I don't really know what to say here, actually. Since that x is an A, we are done, okay? Maybe not the slickest way to write it, but that's okay. Case two. Now we're going to say, well, what if x is in this guy, A minus B? Uh, x is in A minus B. 
what does this mean? Well, let's use the definition of set difference, okay? Then x is an element of a and x is not an element of b. Do we have what we want already? Again, yes. Since x is an element of a, we are done. <laughs> Right? So we've shown that in both cases, and I know what you're thinking, maybe there's a third case where x is an element of a intersect b and a minus b, right? Because remember, x can be in this or in this or both. But if you do try that third case, you're going to get a contradiction because remember, from our picture, we saw that these two sets were disjoint, meaning they have an empty intersection. So x cannot be in both of these. And to convince yourself of that, Look what happens if it's in both. We get x is in A and x is in B, and we get x is in A and x is not in B. And that's a blatant contradiction there, right? So it turns out these are the only two cases, and from these two cases we've shown that in both of them x must be in A, and therefore we've proven the reverse direction of this subset proof, and therefore we're done with the whole proof. So hopefully that made sense. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you have any questions, let me know below. Like, subscribe, do all that stuff, but most importantly, keep flexing those brain muscles, and I'll see y'all later.